In the early hours of the 29th of May 1914, the RMS Empress of Ireland was involved in a devastating collision which resulted in a complete loss within 15 minutes, claiming the lives of over a thousand people. It was the worst peacetime marine disaster in Canadian history, yet unlike the Titanic tragedy only two years prior, it remains relatively unheard of. In 1905, the Canadian Pacific Railway Company ordered two new vessels to serve on their scheduled route across the Atlantic. It was one part of the lucrative mail trade between Hong Kong and Britain, which involved an ocean leg across the Pacific, a railway transit across Canada, and another ocean passage across the Atlantic to Britain. The vessels Empress of Ireland and her sister the Empress of Britain were completed in 1906 and were some of the largest ships of the time, at 14,191 gross registered tonnes and 570 feet or 170 metres in length. They spent the following eight years ferrying passengers and cargo back and forth across the Atlantic between Quebec City in Canada and Liverpool in Britain. On the 28th of May 1914, the Empress of Ireland departed Quebec at 16.30 with 1,057 passengers and 420 crew. It was her 96th crossing and it began like any other transiting the St Lawrence River towards pointe au pere or Father's Point where she disembarked the harbour pilot in the early hours of the 29th. After resuming her northeasterly heading, she sighted the lights of another vessel off her starboard bow probably heading inbound towards the pilot station. It was the Storstedt, a Norwegian collier sailing from Sydney to Quebec with a cargo of 10,400 tonnes of coal. She was smaller than the Empress at only 6,028 gross registered tonnes and a length of 440 feet or 134 metres. On first sighting, the distance was estimated at around 6 miles. I assume that means that only the masthead lights were visible as they can be seen further away than side lights. The visibility at the time was good, but very quickly fog rolled in, hiding the ships from one another. Now, fog is very common in the St Lawrence because the warm air rolling in from the land holds a lot of moisture, which condenses when it meets the freezing cold river. Ships are used to it, so both vessels continued on their respective passages, sounding their whistles to indicate their presence. On the Empress of Ireland, they really couldn't see much until suddenly they spotted the navigation lights of another ship around 100 feet off their starboard bow. A few seconds later, the Storstead rammed into the starboard side of the Empress of Ireland, hitting her midships straight between the funnels. The design of Storstad's bow had a devastating effect on the Empress, tearing a gaping hole straight through her hull into the engine room. Empress of Ireland lurched to starboard, rapidly taking on water. Within minutes, the list was so bad that the port lifeboats could no longer be lowered. The ones that tried quickly capsized, tipping their occupants into the freezing river. On the starboard side, five lifeboats were successfully launched, with a sixth capsizing. Five or six minutes after the collision, the power failed, plunging the Empress of Ireland into darkness. Around five minutes after that, the ship took another lurch further over to starboard which gave passengers on the port side the opportunity to climb out of portholes onto the side of the hull. A few minutes later at 2.14, only 14 minutes after the collision, Empress of Ireland's bow rose briefly out of the water before slipping beneath the waves as the ship sank. Nearby, Storstad was still afloat using her own lifeboats to rescue as many survivors as she could. Back in pont au -Pere, the radio operator had picked up the distressed call and dispatched vessels to assist. The first to arrive was the pilot vessel Eureka, which recovered 150 people from the water and took them back to the shore. One hour later, the mail ship Lady Evelyn arrived on the scene but found no more survivors. Instead, she took all the survivors that had been rescued by the Storstad and transported them back to the shore for medical treatment. The Storstad herself could still manoeuvre, so she limped on into Quebec City under her own steam. Out of the 1,477 souls on board, 1,012 lost their lives that night, making it the worst peacetime marine disaster in Canadian history. Soon after the tragedy, an inquiry was established to find the cause and essentially establish blame. As litigation was involved, predictably, two different stories emerged. According to the Empress of Ireland, they first saw the Storstad on the starboard bow around six or seven miles away. They then altered course to run down the river, I assume that meant to starboard, with the intention of passing Storstad green to green. That just means that both ships would show their green side light to the other. 
At that point, fog rolled in, so they slowed down, eventually reversing their engines so that they were stopped in the water. The next thing they know, they see the masthead and both side lights of another vessel a hundred feet from their starboard side. They tried running their engines full ahead to get out of the way, but it was too late. Storstad's story is similar, but there are a few differences. They first sighted the Empress of Ireland on their port bow, around six or seven miles away, with the lights open to starboard, meaning they could work out the heading of the other vessel. The vessels got closer together until they saw the Empress of Ireland's green side light. After that, they noticed the lights changing, indicating the other vessel was turning. The masthead lights came into line, and they could see the port side light. As the turn continued, the green light disappeared, and only the red light was visible. The Storstad then assumed that the two vessels were running clear of one another, passing red to red. At that point, the fog rolled in, and they lost sight of the Empress of Ireland. The next thing they see is the masthead lights of a liner running right ahead of them less than a hundred feet away. They put their engines full astern, but it was too late. Both stories share a lot of similarities, but there seem to be differences about where the Empress of Ireland steadied up before the fog rolled in. Empress believed they were on a green to green crossing, while Storstad believed they were on a red to red. In the end, the inquiry blamed the Storstad for the collision, claiming that they altered course to starboard after the fog had rolled in. Of course, the other complication here is that altering course to starboard is the accepted action in restricted visibility, so on that account, the Storstad might have been the innocent party. Regardless, the inquiry did blame the Storstad, whose owners were ordered to pay damages to the Canadian Pacific Railway Company, which included the seizure and sale of the Storstad herself. Unfortunately, the litigious nature of this sort of inquiry makes the truth harder to determine, which makes it harder to learn how to prevent these sort of things from happening again. Nonetheless, there were things that we did learn. Inverted bows, while popular at the time, were proved to be deadly in the event of a collision. Longitudinal bulkheads, while good in some situations, were proved to be hazardous in this sort of collision, highlighting the need for cross-flooding, which you'll now find on all modern vessels. And of course, we can't fail to mention watertight integrity. The Empress of Ireland was proceeding down the river with portholes open for ventilation and watertight doors open. I don't know what difference it would have made, but it may have at least slowed down the flooding. Although it was over a hundred years ago, the lessons from the Empress of Ireland are still important to know today.